Foundation and good morning to our online family. If you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you with the peace of the Lord and hope that you get to stay with us to experience the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To hear more and experience more about love and unity in our church, you may subscribe and follow us on our YouTube channels and on our Facebook channels. Today's call of worship comes from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 12, which reads, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with fervent tears and cries to the one who would save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by time, by this time you are to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. This verse reminds us of what Jesus Christ went through when he was on earth and how he demonstrated the act of obedience. He was scared, but he did not stop praying to God, even though he knew that death was waiting for him around the corner, and even though he knew that he would be mocked and crucified. He did not just decide to switch sides to avoid suffering. He trusted God to take care of all his problems. The only weapon he used during his times of trial was prayer. He did not stop praying. May we take a lesson from Jesus' way of going about in life. May we never cease praying, worshipping God through our hard times and, of course, through the happiest moments of our lives. May we remember to consult God through his written word in the Bible as we go through this week that lies ahead of us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Enjoy today's service. Merciful God, with humble hearts, we gather in your presence, acknowledging our shortcomings and seeking your boundless mercy. We come before you, confessing our transgressions, those moments where our thoughts, words, and actions have fallen short of the love and grace you call us to embody. Loving Father, we admit that we have not always directed our hearts fully towards you. Our attention has wavered and we have been entangled in distractions that have led us astray. We confess that our words have at times been careless and hurtful. We have spoken without considering the impact of our speech on others. And for that, we ask for your forgiveness. Compassionate Creator, we acknowledge that we have not consistently shown love to our neighbors as you have commanded. In our self-centeredness, we have overlooked the opportunities to extend a helping hand 
and a listening ear. Lord, we lay before you the weight of our actions, both those we have committed and those we have failed to undertake. We will recognize the times when we could have made a positive difference, but chose not to. As we stand here, bearing our souls and seeking a deeper understanding of our weakness, we ask for your forgiveness. May our knowledge of our shortcomings serve as a catalyst for growth, transforming us into vessels of your love and grace. In your infinite compassion, Father, grant us the courage to forgive ourselves just as you forgive us. May this confession kindle within us a stronger determination to walk in your light, to embrace our humanity, and to foster reconciliation wherever it is needed. We present this prayer imperfect but sincere, yearning for your mercy and strength to rise above our failures. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
does not envy, he does not boast. His ways are higher than my own. His thoughts consume the great unknown. Of this alone, I am sure, my God is love. family let's listen to the word of the lord it comes from first kings chapter 19 verses 1 to 14 ahab told jezebel all that elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword then jezebel sent a messenger to elijah saying so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary plume tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I, I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. He went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Elijah meets God at Horeb. He said, 
Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. In Psalm 42, the psalmist cries out to God and explains what people are saying to him. He says, my tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you so downcast? Oh, my soul, why so disturbed within me? Lord, why have you forgotten and rejected me? This echoes Elijah, because somewhere, sometime in Elijah's ministry, probably during the exhausting and dramatic encounter with the prophets of Baal, Elijah began to believe that this ministry thing was all about him. Even Ahab, in his breathless recounting of the event to Jezebel, highlighted the prophet's role. He told her all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Maybe if you kill 450 prophets of Baal, you start to think you're something. You call down rain after a three year drought and you start to think you're sort of powerful. It was quite a show and Elijah was front and center until the queen, Jezebel, in the fury of her anger, swore to kill him within 24 hours. And suddenly all the bravado is gone. Elijah disappears faster than leaven at Passover. He arrives in Beersheba, where he leaves his servant and goes into the desert, the Negev desert, and begins to bemoan his fate. He is what we call despondent. The, the Afrikaans word for despondent, well, there's probably a couple of them, but one that I can remember offhand is van hoop, being without hope, or moodless, being without courage. The dictionary defines despondent as having lost courage, being low spirited, lacking confidence, lacking hope. It comes from two words, de, which is without, and spondere, which is to promise. And the word, so the word literally means without promise. A person is despondent when he or she, who once had confidence in the promise of good things, somehow has lost or given up on that confidence. My dad, whose anniversary of his death was, was on Wednesday, seven years ago, he used to love Roger's thesaurus. Nowadays we work with, with tablets, but in those days we worked with real books. And Roger's thesaurus is a book, big thick book uh, with synonyms and idioms. And Roger's thesaurus gives the following for despondency, faltering, losing hope, losing heart, abandoning hope, giving up hope, sinking into despair, turning one's face to the wall, plumbing the depths, hitting rock bottom. And of course, if you've been on this earth for a very short time, not even very long, 
you probably don't need much dictionary work to understand despondency. You can probably think of someone who's been so far down in the dumps they've given up hope and ceased trying. Despondency wraps its thick black tentacles around a person and drags him or her down. Activity either ceases or is greatly diminished. And in biblical terms, such a person loses heart. Paul wrote to the Church of Galatia in chapter 6 verse 9 and he said, Let us not lose heart. The despondent person may even consider suicide. Despondency, if it continues, can become depression, which seems to be despondency that does not leave. Now, just to clarify that my sermon today is not a, a psychological one. It's not about um, the clinical forms of depression, but it is about despondency and depression. But what causes despondency? Where does it come from? How is it that an otherwise normal, healthy, even successful person can suddenly fall into what Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress called the slough of depression or of despondency? As we open our Bibles to 1 Kings 19, we look in on the life and times of God's prophet Elijah. And we find him thickly mired in the slough of despond. Last week we looked at the, the amazing uh, contest on the Mount of Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And now we look at chapter 19 verses 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. In the original Hebrew, the word all is repeated in this verse three times. It says, Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So this, this great prophet who had stood up against the foreign, false and foreign gods suddenly becomes afraid. And it says in verse 3, and I love the Bible being so honest about it. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life. So a moment ago he was running in, in exultation and excitement ahead of the chariot of Ahab and now he runs away to save his life. So it says he came to Beersheba, verse 3, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. The, the tree uh, echoes his own internal state of despondency. He came and his feeling of being alone, he asked that he might die. He said, it's enough now, Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. I've had enough. We all can identify with that. Now, the story would not be as remarkable if this were not the same man who, in the previous chapter, courageously and single-handedly took on 450 prophets of Baal. This is Elijah, the firebrand prophet of the desert, who called down fire from heaven, who brought on a drought with his prayers, who then prayed again and there was a cloudburst. The rain came. Now he's despondent. And a thinking person has to ask why. It seems that he's lost perspective. Look at the symptoms of his despair. They're the same ones that despondent people exhibit today. In verse 4 and 5, we see some of these symptoms. I'm sure you've observed some of these in your friends or loved ones or in yourself. Now, despondency isn't limited to a particular group of people. It happens to all people from all walks of life. Uh, I can think of a couple of 
successful, so-called successful people, people who are famous, who suffered from it. Winston Churchill, for a moment, for, for an ex as an example, he was given to bouts of despondency. Edgar Allan Poe, the poet, fell into a deep depression. The post-impressionist painter Vincent van Gogh struggled with periods of despondency so deep that at one point he cut off his ear and he ultimately committed suicide. Now here the prophet Elijah, the man destined never to die, but rather to be translated. In other words, the most powerful and successful prophet of his day is so deeply despondent, he's asking God to take his life. What irony, what a condition is despondency. It's powerful. It can seize even the, those who are true believers in its grip. Now, part of Elijah's condition was nothing more than exhaustion. Too much strain for too many hours with too little food. And God knew that. And there's a beautiful prelude to his, to his uh, vision of God, where God sends an angel to minister to him. Very similar to the way God sends the angels to minister to Jesus when he's in the wilderness and fasting. In verse 5 it says, Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. God sees his loneliness. God sees his despondency. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. <clears throat> so Elijah's bout of depression was about his tiredness, the stress that he'd been under, but it also went deeper than his exhaustion and lack of food. It drove him back to the very roots of Israel's history, back to Horeb, to Sinai, the mountain of God where where Moses received the Ten Commandments. And we read that when he ate and drank, he went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, to Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, we don't know why he went to that mountain, whether he was going by God's uh, pushing him or his own inclination. But it seems it went on his own steam since Elsewhere, when he was moved, it says specifically according to the word of the Lord, but we don't see that here. No matter what the case, the change of location didn't stop his despondency. He merely swapped his juniper tree for a cave somewhere on Sinai. And in verse 9, we read, At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? Sometimes despondent people think that if you could change the location of your circumstances, it would surely resolve their condition. Or people who see, have people in their families who are despondent, they think they'll uh, just change their, their location and things will change. I mean, we've all heard despondent people saying, I'm going to leave town, I'm going to get away, far away from this place as I can. Everything bad has ever happened to me has happened here. Some will leave marriages, some will leave careers. If you, if you ask them where you're going to go, they, they, they will say, I don't know any place but here. What you're going to do, I don't know, but anything has to be better than this. But the reason for this is that a person in this condition is highly vulnerable to a lot of things, not the least of which is hurting themselves and those they love. But frankly, very often in this condition, they don't care. Such an approach seldom works because while it may, may remove one from a problem geographically, the despondency usually ret returns because it's, it's with you, it's in you, often with even greater intensity. Well, why? Because as we are going to see, despondency is not so much caused by circumstances as by a response to these circumstances. 
moving to a new location, getting a new job, may remove the circumstance. But the trouble is it does not remove the faulty way of coping with circumstances. It only remains, therefore, to get set up in a new circumstance, begin responding, and soon there are new issues and the despondency returns. What has to change is our way of coping. Now, I'm not suggesting that all depression is simply a matter of changing the way we are coping, but some depression is as a result of incorrect ways of engaging with our lives, unhealthy ways. I remember reading years ago a book about how to win over depression. And the author gives what he calls a formula for depression. I hate formulas for those kind of things because they seldom actually can explain the, the broadness, the, the, the uh, many factors that are involved. But there is some truth in what he wrote. He said, this is the formula, insult or injury or rejection or disappointment plus anger and resentment times self-pity equals depression. And ironically, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the very, very popular form of therapy these days, echoes this very formula because it talks about the fact that a negative event, an injury, can activate something. Uh, they can lead to emotional distress and it, it goes on to, to look at the fact that it can lead to distress which brings up anger and resentment and these two can actually uh, lead to self-pity and then lead to depression. Now self-pity is an interesting thing and we're going to look at it a little bit now. It's, it's often a cognitive distortion. In other words, it's a, it's a distortion of the way we think. And we start to then see ourselves as a victim. We magnify our personal suffering. We feel helpless. And that can be as a result of two things. It can be a result of um, emotional reasoning. So believing things without objective evidence and negative filtering. In other words, focusing only on the negative aspects of the situation. And the culmination of these aligns with, with depression, which is a, is a state of being where you have very negative views about the world and about yourself and about the future. And when these distorted emotional responses and self-pity combine, they can contribute to long extended depression. That's why it's so important to talk to people, to talk to God, to talk to a therapist about depression and negative feelings. Now, I'm not proposing that this formula is a universal cure for depression, but I would like to point out that in a day and age where, where there's a great deal of medication being thrown at people who have depression, there's, there's very little talk of how we can actually behave with, in a behavioral way, change uh, our depressive state. And that has a lot to do with, with it's something spiritual. Something needs to turn, something needs to change. And the Bible does speak into these situations. That's, that's what this text is all about. And an awful lot of people not even looking for that, they're dealing with the symptoms. They're not actually dealing with the source. That's why there's a great deal of, of success when people come, for, come to therapy or talk to somebody uh, about their depression. So let's look at this process. When something happens that hurts us, like an insult or an injury, a typical human response is anger. And while anger is not wrong in itself, if anger is not dealt with, if it's not expressed, if it's not looked at, it can turn to resentment very quickly. And that's why the Bible, which is a very honest book about the truth about our lives, says, warns us not to let the sun go down on our anger. 
because if if we are angry for too long resentment starts to to develop and resentment is something that hardens us and actually prevents us from healing and resentment is nothing more than just playing that wrong over and over and over again in our minds reliving its hurt and sometimes we have to do that it, it's it's a natural part of us the anger is natural the resentment is natural but if we keep on going over that over and over again to feel it again which is literally what the word means and then something actually happens to us um, when resentment is harbored for very long uh, as a result of that we have self-pity not just sadness but self-pity um, now I'm not suggesting that everybody who is depressed has self-pity but I am saying that we see self-pity in this text in Elijah we is, is someone who feels mistreated misused disappointed disadvantages and this multiplies the perception of the problem and eventually actually has an, a very big impact on us maybe getting stuck <clears throat> The problem is then perceived as too big. Uh, we, we become hopeless, never going to get out of this. There's no solution. It's impossible. I give up. And these are classic words of a depressed, despondent person. And what a person often will do in this case is withdraw because his or her hope is gone. <clears throat> they are people who are despondent, in other words, without promise. And that leads to a lifelessness, a non-action mode, because that hopeless feeling leads to kind of despair and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We stop working, we stop moving and it becomes even more complicated because the, that person will do less, the situation becomes even worse. So that's, that's just looking at the scope of the problem. If we diagram this, this type of down this depression, it might be best drawn as a downward helix where bad feelings lead to bad responses, which leads to worse feelings, which lead to more bad responses. So look at Elijah's case. The insult, the injury came when he returned from Carmel. He was expecting Israel to change after he had given his best, risked his, risked his neck for them against the false prophets. But obviously there was not a good response. There wasn't an immediate and large return to the worship of Yahweh. In fact, the king's wife, Jezebel, vowed to kill him. What a way to treat a man who selflessly risked his neck to save his nation. Who wouldn't be angry? But Elijah didn't try to call down fire from heaven to consume them. He did something nearly as bad. He ran away. He chose to let his anger fester. He resented Israel. He resented Jezebel. Listen to his words in verse 10. For the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, and killed thy prophets with the sword. So we see the insult, the disappointment. Now we see the anger and resentment. And where is the self-pity? Well, it follows very shortly after that. He says in verse 4, and it's a highly manipulative uh, response. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Now, of course, self-pity multiplies uh, an inaccurate perception of the problem externally in other people, but also within us. It makes it bigger than it is, and we only see the problem. Here's the proof from Elijah's perception He's, how many people are still faithful in Israel? He says in verse 10, I alone am left. Now, was that a true perception? No, in fact, you'll see God clears that issue up right away in verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that, he has not, that has not kissed him. Elijah says there's only one person. God says there are plenty, there are thousands. Self-pity can be destructive and can lead to a blocking of the emotions and prevent us from being free. 
Modern psychology defines self-pity as a self-focused emotional response characterized by a sense of victimhood, helplessness, and excessive concern for one's suffering or misfortune. And we've all been there. Being sorry for ourselves, dwelling on our difficulties, often to the point of ignoring potential solutions. And it can lead to a negative rumination, in other words, a negative ways of thinking, where we become trapped in a cycle of negative thoughts and emotions. And that can hinder us from living, can stop us from living. Now, I'm not, I'm making a distinction here between self-pity and healthy self-compassion, which involves acknowledging and soothing oneself in times of distress. Um, self-pity is a different thing. It, it is, a, is a negative way of engaging with things. It's not about being sad. It's about wallowing. It's about staying in a, in a place of resentment. In uh, Romans 8.28 we read, For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Self-pity is the antithesis of this verse. It's the denial of it. It cannot see God in any circumstance. And so God is going to call his despondent prophet back. The first thing he does with Elijah's anger towards Israel is work with that. And he does it in a very mysterious way. In verse 11, God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. In response to all of the things that Elijah was, was experiencing, even the negative thoughts, God doesn't leave him there. God moves towards him and engages. He has an encounter with God. It says, now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. Now, what does this mean, this wind, this earthquake, this fire? In each case, the, the scripture declares that the Lord was not in these destructive elements, these so-called images there where you might think God was involved. He wasn't in the wind, in the earthquake or the fire. Other times God had appeared in that way, but not this time. Elijah, Elijah didn't respond to any of these destructive elements. He didn't even budge from the cave. But it wasn't until the gentle blowing that the prophet stirred. Verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's beautiful. It's tender. It's gentle. That's God's approach to those who are depressed or despondent or who have self-pity. It's not judgment. He, he, he meets with him. He, he, he ministers to him with the angels. He feeds him. Then God comes again to him and he, he comes in a gentleness, a very gentle way. And then God asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? You see, Elijah was fed up. He was angry, he was frustrated with Israel. He was probably angry with God as well, even though he wouldn't have acknowledged that. He would probably also have gladly watched as God destroyed them after his best attempts at getting them to repent failed. But God wasn't ready to destroy Israel. He wasn't in these destructive elements. He was calling Elijah and then of course after that, Israel through a gentle wind, silence. And Elijah in his anger in the cave suddenly sees God's lesson. It was wrong of him to resent Israel. That was outside God's will for him. His self-pity, his resentment, his entrenched ways of seeing this, God was turning him away, turning, getting him to repent, to turn away from that way of thinking. And he finally accepted that it was God's will now for things to be as they were. In verse 13 of 
the third part, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, he went and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he still hasn't changed. He says, he answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. Elijah's perception hasn't changed yet, but he's honest in what he believes. I think there's a humility that begins here. His attitude is beginning to change. And I think the truth is that when God looks at our despondency, when we work with our own despondency, there's a process that is involved, a process that God can take us through if we allow God to do that. And so the Lord gives him instructions. He says, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. He tells him to anoint Hazael as king. He tells him to anoint Jehu, anoint Elisha. Um, so God actually gives him a task. Um, so three things seem evident to me in these verses. First, the best therapy for a depressed person, once they understand the problem, is to get active again in doing something, to have a purpose with God. With no further explanation, God gives Elijah the hope he needs. Hope is very often something that is generated in action, in movement, which of course is counterintuitive because you don't feel like moving, you don't feel like going anywhere. But it's, it's about moving away from the resentment and the self-pity and suddenly things begin to change. God gives him a second assignment. Secondly, God is saying here yeah, in so many words to Elijah, I haven't been dethroned by Jezebel. I still have a plan. You are still part of that plan. God is actually involving Elijah in his plan. He's getting Elijah to see the bigger picture, which you cannot see when you're depressed. That's why we need to get help when we are depressed. And so he proceeds to tell Elijah to go and anoint a king who will be over the nation and who will right the wrongs that have been done. The third thing that we see in this text, God corrects Elijah's distorted perception of reality, brought on by the brooding, the resentment, the self-pity. And he tells him, don't worry, Elijah, you may feel that you're alone, but I have 7,000, I have several thousand that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Maybe you've been suffering from that kind of despondency. It's very similar to what Elijah did. Maybe you know someone who has been suffering from despondency. What are the things that we've learned from the text so far that might apply? Well, the symptoms like words of resignation, thoughts of suicide, withdrawal from activity, are all symptoms of despondency and depression, which we need to become aware of. Many people have struggled with this. Your struggle is not, not, not uncommon. That's important to realize. Secondly, we need to be aware that sometimes the cause of depression goes deeper than just exhaustion or other physical issues. Sometimes it results from faulty responses to problems, a faulty perception of reality. It definitely can cause that. And yes, medication is a good thing, especially healthy medication like antidepressants. There's nothing wrong with that, but it has to go alongside with therapy, with talking, with also an involvement of that person with what they're struggling with. Especially when depressions are triggered by wrongs done to us by others and disappointment. The third thing this teaches us is that resentment can extract a heavy price from us when we allow ourselves to indulge in it. It's a way of thinking and acting that has devastating effects on us. That's why it's so emphasized in the New Testament. Forgiveness is so emphasized because and redemption, because redemption can free us from the, the darkness of this kind of depression that has 
is almost sees no light. Sometimes far from being some malady that drifts in on us that we can't control or conquer, depression can be affected by the way we think, the way we act. And that means that it can also change if we think carefully about it and allow God to change our lives. It means there is hope even in despondency. That is something that Elijah learns. And that hope is centered in God. That hope is also centered in God's healing. And God's healing does come by people. So don't be afraid to share what you're going through with people, especially people you trust. The final thing I want to say is, and it's not something we always realize, and I'm not saying it as a, as a cliche, that God really does cause all things to work together for good, even the bad things and the good things. God will use those things to cause all things to work together for good. That is what I believe. And that is what Elijah was able to see. The thing is we need to trust even when it seems that everything is not going our way. Let us pray. Lord, as we've looked at despondency and we become aware of our own, help us, give us strength, bring people into our lives that can alter the tra trajectory of this, this illness and where we have indulged through resentment, through bitterness, through self-pity. Help us to be free from that so that we can be healed and begin to serve you again. Thank you that you come to us with such gentleness and love. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.